Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Geological Society of London and to this, the fifth Shell London Lecture for 2012, entitled Unconventional Gas. My name is Nick Billum uh, and I'm responsible for policy and strategy matters here at the Geological Society. It's my great pleasure to thank Shell UK for making this series of public lectures possible and also to introduce our speaker this afternoon to you. Now, in the last decade or so in North America, uh, the application of modern technologies for drilling and for recovering hydrocarbons uh, has resulted in a huge increase in the exploration and development of so-called unconventional gas, and more recently, uh, light-tight oil. I have to be careful how you say that one. Uh, these, these are hydrocarbons which are trapped in impermeable or tight rocks rocks from which until fairly recently there didn't appear to be any realistic prospect of extracting hydrocarbon resources economically. Here to tell us about the origin and range of these unconventional resources, their potential to help us meet our global energy needs and the controversies surrounding their exploration is Dr Melvin Giles, who is theme leader, global theme leader for unconventional gas at Shell Exploration and Development, uh, based in Houston. Now, Melvin has modestly asked me not to uh, uh, tell you about his uh, illustrious career in depth, but suffice it to say he has a, a long and illustrious career at Shell, uh, that he has published over 30 academic papers, edited one book and authored a second. Uh, and in his spare time, although I'm amazed to hear he has any, I understand that he enjoys flying, photography, and travel. Please welcome, ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Melvin Giles. Good afternoon, and uh, thank, uh, thank you all for finding time to uh, come here and listen to me. And also thanks to the Society for the, uh, introdu uh, for the introduction and the offer to come here. Um, I want to cover a number of things. I want to tell you a little bit about this uh, revolution that's occurred in the, in the States in terms of uh, production of uh, gas and more recently oil from tight sources. I want to tell you something about how much is out there, a bit about where it is. Um, and uh, I want to uh, talk about how it forms. You can't go to the Geological Society without talking some geology. I absolutely refuse to do that, so you, you, not to do that, so you're going to see geology uh, uh, today. There are, well, I'm also going to cover uh, the extraction methods and eventually the contro some of the contro controversies around it. Um, and at the end, I hope to be able to answer your questions. So let's, uh, with that, let's push on. Uh, this is, uh, uh, well, I'd like to say that's from my sponsors. Uh, I think if you read it, what it actually says is don't believe a word I say. Uh, <laughs> But uh, my lawyer friend here will uh, probably uh, tell you otherwise. Um, so let's talk, start with the big picture. And let's talk a bit about what this revolution is about. So it's all about energy. And it's all about meeting global energy needs. And if you think about it, the energy demands from the world are, are growing many times. Take China, for instance, with the... So now in 2035, we're looking at an eight times growth in the energy demand from China. Um, you know, and other countries are following that. At the same time, we're having to face uh, one of the biggest challenges mankind has had, ever had to face, and that's the problem of global warming. So we have to uh, somehow address both the energy problem and the climate problem, and uh, recognise that uh, we also have to take into account the aspirations of many people around the world for a better life. In terms of uh, this revolution, uh, way, way back in the um, beginning of uh, around about 1995, in the US, there was a projection that demand, the demand uh, curve for uh, natural gas would require imports of 100 to uh, uh, 17 BCM a year um, by uh, 2010. 
In fact, none of those imports of LNG have happened in the States. Instead, we've seen this growth in tight gas, coal bed methane, and shale gas. These three, shale gas, tight gas, and coal bed methane, constitute what the industry calls unconventional gas. And we can see at the minute, it's forming a very large proportion of the US energy mix. And there is even talk of exporting gas from North America to Europe and the Far East uh, to um, meet the demands elsewhere. And that, that is a complete turnaround from this picture of only a few years ago of a, a huge demand for LNG in the States. But this revolution is not a fast revolution. It actually started in the 70s with tax credits to um, onshore operations, uh, new technologies for onshore operations, which resulted first in the growth of coal bed methane and later in the growth of tight gas and only finally in about uh, 2000 onwards after a 15 year odyssey of how to produce this stuff by Mitchell Energy that shale gas really took off. And it's made quite an impact on prices. So the, these are, whoops, I knew I'd do that. Um, so these are uh, gas prices in the US, uh, gas prices around the world versus time. And you can see that um, if we look at the Henry Hub price, which is this mustard colored curve, for a long time it was tracking the other prices like uh, uh, the uh, national balancing uh, price, uh, the Japanese uh, cocktail, etc. But then, all of a sudden, it dives and it stays low. Gas prices in the US at the minute are around about $2 a million standard cubic feet, as opposed to European prices, which are hugely higher. Why? All of a sudden, they've got this vast excess of gas that is the result uh, of uh, the uh, exploitation of shale gas. And they're also now exploiting, of course, like tidal oil, which is uh, basically something very similar, which we'll discuss in a minute. But what is this doing? This is creating jobs. This is creating a resurgence in American industry. It's making American energy prices very competitive. And you can see that in general, the things that become the gas prices have been coming decoupled from oil prices. And so we really, uh, the world does have an opportunity here to uh, use what is essentially a cleaner fossil fuel, uh, coal bed, uh, um, natural, natural gas, of course, methane is one of the cleanest uh, fuels around, um, that could replace other fuels such as coal. And in the States, you're seeing um, not only the movement in uh, towards LNG, uh, but uh, uh, and possible exports, but you're also starting to think about how they could use the gas in other ways for trains, for transport, um, for chemicals, etc. So it's sparking whole new, um, whole new areas of uh, activity. So let's uh, switch a bit now to what's different about it. Well, there's a number of things that are very different about unconventional gas from um, conventional gas. First of all, um, it's, called un it's called unconventional, as I'll show you in a minute, because the hydrocarbons are not trapped in the conventional dome-shaped structures or faulted structures we see in the subsurface. They're also trapped in low permeability rocks. That means rocks where the flow of gas through the rock is impeded. The recovery of the, uh, the amount of gas you recover from a well is relatively low, one to 10 BCF a well, and the production profile looks like this. Consequence of that is you need many more wells to produce a large volume of gas, hundreds or thousands, as opposed to tens or hundreds. But there is lower upfront investment, um, it requires a manufacturing mentality uh, because what you're doing is you're drilling lots of wells. And of course, that comes with the challenge outside of desert areas of North America in doing that in an environmentally friendly way. 
And there is also significant learning on the cost front. So this little diagram here shows how uh, if you index the, the, the length of time it takes us to drill a well to 100, if you look at the first field we got into, Pinedale, we've gradually reduced the costs over time. And that's a result of knowing how to drill the wells faster, how, what equipment is superfluous but, uh, and is safe to remove, uh, uh, how to do the completions better or effectively, uh, controlling costs on the supply chain, etc. Um, but more recently, much more recent wells like ground, those in the ground birch accumulation in Canada, we are learning much more far, uh, much more quickly, so that you can um, uh, uh, dr uh, make the cost drop much faster. In that sort of model, this um, cost savings by learning is something that's integral to the uh, development of unconventional gas and the economics. So let's transition to how much is out there. Um, this is a popular way of looking at it. Um, it's in terms of a tetrahedron, where conventional gas, which is trapped in anticline, so dome-shaped structures in the subsurface or fault structures, in very permeable rocks, which means rocks where the air will flow through them very easily, with a large pores like this photomicrograph shows, that they're at the top. They're the easiest stuff to, to, to produce. As the permeability goes down, so the difficulty of flowing the gas through the subsurface increases, so then it becomes more difficult to extract it economically. And eventually, at first you go to sort of tight gas, much smaller pores, but in conventional sandstones, and then into shale gas, where you into, into a mixed pool system, which I'll talk about in a little while. But as you come down here, you go into poor and poor quality resources, which means that you uh, have less and less uh, ability to extract the gas. You have to use techniques like fracking to, to release it. And the, the volumes basically uh, are generally increasing. Only some of that gas is economically recoverable, meaning that any one gas price or, or fiscal regime or oil price, can you get that? Uh, is it worthwhile getting that gas out? Um, of course, technology means that you, you can uh, advance things uh, faster and make some of this deeper stuff uh, more economic. But in general, the, 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 what is technically recoverable is not what's economically recoverable, and what is technically recoverable is not equal to the gas in the ground, which is um, where I'm going now. So this picture is derived from the data of Rovner, uh, 1997. Um, Rovner's work's been class, uh, been been, re, uh, been redone by lots of people uh, uh, over time, and uh, it's a useful data set to look at because it's the first data set where people, tr where somebody tried to quantify the amount of unconventional gas. So up here is a, a, a dotted line on the uh, uh, that gives you the technically recoverable uh, volume of gas. So it shows you the sort of calibration of histograms. The blue is CBM, the grey is shale gas, and the red is tight gas. Now, these figures are almost certainly wrong because, for one thing, in the North America is the only place this is being commercially exploited at the minute, so the only place where there is really good data to substantiate the volumes. Elsewhere, the volumes are speculative, but the, you can estimate them still from the geological conditions in the subsurface, which is what Rovner did. So you can see that there is a lot in North America, there's a lot in Russia, there's a lot in China. Uh, there is quite a bit in the Middle East and North Africa in particular. There's a lesser amount in Europe. Why? Well, European geology is probably quite broken up. Now, as I say, there are lots of people with figures, and you can pick somebody else's figures, but in general, they show a similar pattern. Uh, just for reference here, you can see the shell positions uh, in... Uh, uh, these little squares, and um, the circles indicate where there's a lot of industry activity at the minute. Move. Please. Oh, okay, that will work. No, back one, please. Okay, so as I was saying, you have a volume... Damn, that's me. 
Uh, you have a volume of gas in the ground, um, which you can estimate from the geological conditions prevailing. But outside North America, you actually don't know whether it really exists, so maybe you have to put some sort of risking on it. And you can then come up with a volume of technically recoverable gas if you know the recovery factor. So not all the gas in the ground is recovered. Typically, for tight sands, the recovery factor is between about 15 and about 50%. For shales, a shale gas, it's around uh, 15 to about 25. So you, a lot of the gas is left in the ground. But you've got a technically recoverable volume of gas. But not all that volume of gas is accessible. Some of it will be under uh, national reserves. Some of it will be under towns. Some of it will be under places you can't get to. So you've got to reduce that volume still further. And then you have to look at what's economically recoverable, which is going to be determined by the fiscal regime in the country. It's going to be determined by the, uh, by the gas price or the oil price, etc. So there's an economically recoverable volume, which is even smaller still. And of course, all that's a moving target because hydrocarbon prices change. So when you see large volumes of gas quoted, particularly gas in the ground quoted from this, remember that's not the whole story. What you really, question you really need to ask is what is economically recoverable. So now let's really dive into the geology. So this is where my passion lies. Um, so what is it? So this is a cross section through the earth. So we're getting deeper down here, that's along the surface. And we have conventional oil and gas fields where the porosity and permeability of these rocks is relatively high. And so you get gas migrating, gas and oil migrating through them. And you get it stuck in dead ends like this, where you get gas trapped on oil, trapped on water, or maybe gas trapped on water. The oil and gas is generated from source rocks, which are buried deeper. And those source rocks start generating when they reach a, a temperature for uh, that's high enough to generate gas or high enough to generate uh, oil. And that's what we're conventionally uh, used to looking at. But, what are, but if you look at this in terms of permeability, so the ease with which gas moves through the rocks, and porosity along here, which is the storage capacity of the rock, then conventional uh, oil and gas deposits fall in this sort of gray, uh, green area up here, Tight gas deposits come down here, and shales, permeability down here. But there is a big difference in how the gas and oil moves through the subsurface. As the rocks get tighter, in other words, the permeability gets lower, so the mechanism of transport through the rocks changes. So in conventional uh, high porosity and permeability rocks, the migration of hydrocarbons is driven by buoyant forces which control the difference in density between the oil or the gas and the water. So they basically float. They float up until they find a dead end. In the case of unconventional gas, the porosity and permeability get so low that surface tension forces become important in trapping the gas. Uh, and those surface tension forces, um, these capillary forces, start to dominate the trapping mechanism, which basically means that instead of the gas flowing to dead ends, like these anticlines and dome state structures, fault, fault structures, etc., the gas will cease to move once it's injected into the rock. Because the, the, the density difference between the gas and the water isn't sufficient to, draw, to overcome the surface tension forces, the capillary forces. So what happens then is on a much bigger scale than you get uh, in conventional oil and gas, you can get what's called basin center gas, which forms deeper in the, in the section where the uh, rocks are quite tight, uh, where the porosity permeability is very low, and uh, the gas is trapped sub-regionally by capillary forces, or even regionally. And typically, this occurs in fluvial sediments, so river-type sediments uh, with coals and things, but uh, can occur in others as well. Um, and it occurs where the source rocks, these um, things are buried uh, below the gas or below, in the case of light tide oil, below the oil window. So this is an example from the Peons Basin in the States. It's not the biggest 
uh, accumulation, but it's a nice one. This would work with some Excel mobile guys. So this is a cross section through the basin. Uh, and I draw your attention to this area here, where basically all the rocks below that dotted line there are all gas saturated, with the exception of that water bearing sand there, which is a continuous higher permeability zone. Why? The coals in, the, in this section and the source rock in this section have generated gas after or while these rocks became tight. The gas has been injected by pressure into these uh, sands and trapped by capillary forces. You can see that um, the uh, maturity, so the level of organic maturity of the source rocks measured by this thing called RO number, uh, here, the top of the gas sort of corresponds to RO1, which is just about the top of the gas window. Um, and as you get further down and deeper, you get more and more uh, generation of gas within the source rock. So instead of having a gas accumulation that occurs over a structure, you've got a gas accumulation that's filling the whole bottom part of the basin over quite a large area. And these accumulations occur, for instance, in the Western Canada sedimentary basin system, which is huge, but they also occur in other areas around the world. Piont's Basin being one. This is an example, a non-US example, um, where uh, we look at a number of wells and we see uh, we've got these channel sands again, uh, which are low permeability in a low permeability matrix, but we have a top of the gas. So the gas is un now underneath the water. It's not floating on top. The gas is trapped by these capillary forces and the, the gas water contact, sorry, the water gas contact, I got that the wrong way around, actually crosses the stratigraphy. So it's not determined by the stratigraphy at all, but is actually determined by the properties of the rock. This is an example, whoops, uh, this is, a, okay, go back. Okay, this is an example for a shell example. This is Pinedale. Pinedale's in Wyoming. It's one of the first uh, areas we got into. What you can see here, this is a, a section down the well, and uh, all these yellow areas here on the gamma ray log of sands. And when they're uh, red, they're gas bearing sands. So you can see here, you've got a huge thickness of ga gas bearing sands. Uh, I think something like 1800 meters, if my memory serves me right. It's part of an anticlinal structure. And if you go off that structure, then the rocks are gas saturated on either side of the structure going down dip. Um, you can see it's a very narrow anticline there. The really interesting thing about Pinedale is when you look at the productivity, so what will the wells produce, then the productivity is controlled by the structure itself. It is basically only, the gas is only producible along the top of the structure. Various explanations for that relating to pressure, uh, uh, volume, amount of gas available, um, possible fractures, it's not really clear. But if you go down the flanks, then you still find gas. But the producibility is controlled by the by the central part of the structure. So this is in sandstone reservoirs. You also get this occurring in siltstone reservoirs. So for those non-geologists here, so uh, a siltstone is something between a mud and a sand. And this is an example from ground birch in British Columbia. You can see the distance here. You can see a number of lobes of um, of siltstone going across the area, prograding out uh, to the uh, southwest. And these siltstones are all gas filled over a very, very large area. So there's a massive uh, basin center siltstone system there. There are a few source rocks in here, but generally this is a system that is uh, a, basin a basin center system. Let's uh, move to talking about shales now, and or mud rocks. Well, first of all, it's, it's incorrect to call this shales, because what these things really are, are source rocks. They are rocks that have enough organic matter in them to generate oil and gas. When they're buried to a high enough temperature, they will generate oil, and then they will generate gas. So first of all, not all shales are shale gas. We'll give you shale gas, only the ones that are source rocks, and then only the ones 
that are, have enough organic carbon, referred to as total organic carbon, to actually develop, um, uh, uh, to store, to, to produce and store enough gas. So this, is, this example is from the Eagleford, which is a, a, um, a, in West Texas. It's actually a carbonate and not a shale. It's a marl. And it produces uh, uh, gas, oil, uh, condensate, and oil from the area. And we'll talk a bit more about that in a second here. So uh, here's uh, Texas. Here's West Texas. And if you go follow the Eagle for, for, for Eagleford through, there's an area that produces dry gas, there's an area that produces condensate, and there's an area that produces oil. And all that reflects is the depth of burial and the heating that's happened to the soil trough. So this is a well log through the section. And uh, what you can see here is this lower Eagleford section, uh, which has a high uh, a response on the gamma ray log, so it's got a lot of natural radioactivity. Um, also uh, contains quite a lot of um, organic carbon, and uh, together with organic carbon in the upper Eagleford, is basically generating this, uh, this oil and gas, and some of it is remaining trapped in the rock itself. The rock having an average porosity of around 6%, has a water saturation of about 56%, the TOC average is 2% in the upper unit, 4% in the lower unit, the porosity is a bit higher in the lower unit, but it really is a uh, marl. And by dr drilling into that uh, with right combination of horizontal wells and fracking, you can produce gas, oil, uh, uh, gas, oil, and condensate. This is another example. This is from um, Haynesville in Louisiana. So this, uh, so it's that sort of area. Uh, in more uh, detail there, but this just shows that in the Bo in the Haynesville Bozier system, the the sedimentology uh, that's shown by each one each one of these, which is a well log. The variation of the well log from, from uh, well to well is not very great. So these are very uniform, very um, continuous. And within them, there are high TOC layers, the mid Bozier, Haynesville, etc., which will produce the oil and which produce the oil and gas and fill these shales with gas. You can see you have a series of wedges again, uh, this time uh, uh, retreating landward. Some of these accumulations are truly massive. This is the Marcellus on the east coast of the US. Um, this is a Devonian shale. Uh, it's a black shale. Um, it occurs over about 63,000 square miles of the eastern US, sitting right under the big industrial centers. It's reckoned to have hundreds of TCF of recoverable gas. It is truly an amazing accumulation. If you develop that, then uh, you'll have gas for a very long time. There are questions about develop, how much of that you can develop, how much you can't, but you get the impression, I hope, that these deposits can be very, very large. I can't speak in Europe without giving you a uh, a quick flick into what's happened in Europe. So there's been a number of shale gas wells drilled in Europe. We drilled three in the Alum Shale in Sweden. Uh, we drilled them because we thought that was the best, uh, most productive shale uh, we could see. It had lots of this uh, organic carbon, 7% in this case, uh, that generates the hy hydrocarbons. Had uh, okay porosity. Um, it was fairly thick. You generally need quite thick accumulations to make this work. But when we drilled it, you can see the well logs here. You can see the organic carbon plot there. That's the gamma ray log. It goes high when you've got a source rock interval, so lots of organic carbon. Uh, you can see the dots there are measured samples. The line is uh, samples that were uh, that were calculated from the well. Uh, sorry, values calculated from the well logs. Um, but despite having drilled three wells in that, we did not see very much gas. The rocks were undersaturated. That comes as a surprise when you read about all these things happening in the States. You know how easy this is. 
This isn't as easy as it sounds, finding the right accumulations. So how do these systems work? More geology, I'm afraid. I'll try and do it simply. Um, so let's talk about the uh, shale gas to start with. And I'd like to make the point that shale gas and basin centre gas are actually linked in a way. So if we look at, along the bottom, the organic carbon that's needed to uh, produce the organic matter that's, uh, sorry, the, the organic carbon that's used uh, up to create the, the gas and oil, and we look at the maturity, which is a, called the VRE or RO, which is a measure of how, um, how deep and how hot the uh, uh, rocks have got during their history. And generally, you start de developing gas uh, when a, you get the VR above 1, generate oil when the VR is above about 0.7. And you can see that there are a wide range of uh, values that work, but typically uh, you need ROs between about 3% and 1%, and you need average TOCs of you know, several, you know, 5% wouldn't be uh, a bad number. Also, I'd like to point out that in these cases, we're dealing with so-called thermogenic shale gas. There's a variety of shale gas I haven't talked about called biogenic shale gas, as represented by the antrim shale, which is shale gas developed uh, in the shallow subsurface by microbes acting on the organic matter. Uh, there's examples of that from Sweden, mid Sweden, but um, you know most of the stuff we talk about in the literature is thermogenic shale gas, and it needs quite high organic carbon contents, and it needs quite high maturities. It will first generate oil, then it will generate condensate, and then it will generate gas. Uh, in the shales, the, the uh, gas is trapped in a number of ways. They can be trapped in <laughs> primary pores. These are pores which are um, developed as a result of the grains, so the space between grains. They can be, uh, as in this case, they can be the result of um, dissolution of a grain, uh, so intraparticle pores, uh, or they can be like this stuff, pores in the organic matter. And uh, that's quite interesting. They can also not only be stored in the pores, but in principle, the methane can be absorbed onto the organic matter. So the absorption of methane onto the organic matter gives us a, a, a source of methane, Unfortunately, the, the amount of that methane trapped by absorption on the organic matter decreases with increasing temperature. So by the time you're dealing with thermogenic shale gas, you are dealing with uh, very low amounts of absorbed gas, largely uh, dealing with um, gas trapped in the pores. So the porosity of the rock becomes the main storage mechanism. These organic nanopores are quite interesting because they develop as the organic matter is heated. And what they may actually represent is sites where the, um, where the, where the hydrocarbons first start to nucleate like bubbles. And um, they become increasingly more complex as you, you, you go forward. But by nucleating as bubbles, you overcome this problem of uh, needing a pressure source to drive the gas or the oil into the primary pores because you have to displace the water in the primary short pores, which is capillary trapped and will require a high pressure for moving it. Okay, so just a, a reflection of um, uh, pore systems in these systems. Uh, so that if that's the gas field porosity, that's the total porosity. In all these systems, so oil, so, uh, oil systems, tight gas system, shale gas system, there's some level of water-filled porosity, typically maybe 2% left in the rock. In the case of tight gas, you're dealing only with one pore system, which is the primary uh, pore system of the rock, the, 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 the gas trap between the grains or where grains have dissolved. In shale gas, you're talking about some water-filled porosity, some primary interparticle porosity, you're talking about some proportion of the gas and oil trapped in this organic nanoporosity, and then you've got absorbed gas. CBM, coal bed methane, which I'm not going to talk very much about, is dominantly absorbed gas. So what happens 
So somehow we have to get the gas from these micro, uh, these nanopores into the primary pores and eventually out into the sands. So, but the first thing is you have to create a shale gas accumulation, uh, which means you have to drive the gas and oil into the primary pore network of the shale, or the pore network of the shale, other than the organic pore network, which requires a dirty, uh, a very large pressure engine. That pressure engine is controlled by the volume change when the organic matter changes from uh, from uh, kerogen, which is the term for organic matter, into uh, oil and gas. That volume change generates a very large pressure, which first fills the uh, the pores in the organic uh, in the organic shale, and eventually the non inorganic portion of the shells. And if it's high enough, and if the generation of gas and oil is large enough, it can also push it into the surrounding tight shales. Uh, sorry, tight sands. So, basis of the gas accumulation is to develop something like this. We have a source rock system. We have a sand system, generally um, fairly discontinuous sands, and we bury it. And eventually, this organic matter starts to become um, starts to become uh, into the oil and gas generation window. As we do that, initially, the sandstones do not have a permeability, in other words, ability to flow gas that is sufficiently low to trap it. So the gas moves up dip by buoyancy driven flow and accumulates in structures. But eventually the porosity and permeability falls low enough and we start to get the gas filling the sand and forming a continuous gas phase in the sand, but only where the pressure engine in the source rocks that's caused by the massive over generate, uh, uh, massive generation of oil and gas is, su is sufficient to push to drive it, uh, to drive the gas into a uh, into the, uh, the, the the sandstone pores and overcome the capillary forces. Eventually, as you go up dip, you come to an area where the uh, sands uh, are still relatively permeable, and then you get a, that strange mixture of conventional and unconventional accumulations of gas. Uh, often these systems are uplifted, which has the economic benefit of bringing them closer to the surface, so less drilling costs. Uh, but as you uplift it, water comes back into the system, typically along these permeable sands that were up in the transition zone up here. So what I want to emphasize here is the generation of hydrocarbons, the pressure generation uh, that is needed uh, to drive the hydrocarbons into these tight rocks. So there ends the geology. Uh, now, uh, we'll talk a bit about the extraction process. So, as I said before, um, we're talking about rocks, uh, sorry, oil and gas trapped in low permeability rocks. Typically, if it's a shale gas accumulation, you're talking of a, uh, a shale layer that's somewhere between two and a half and three kilometers, or maybe four or five kilometers below the surface, with the exception of biogenic shale gas, which is obviously something much closer to the surface. Um, now, to reach that uh, and extract it, you're basically going to drill a, horizontal, uh, a vertical well and then a horizontal well that's going to follow the source rock. The aquifers where drinking water comes from are typically in the first 500 meters. And um, where you're fracking is here, typically is occurring at depths of two and a half to three kilometers. The size of these fracks, and I'll talk about how that's determined in a minute, is typically of the order of 100 meters. So we're fracking way below the, uh, the water table. So why do we frack? So Basically, a frack looks like that. We have a vertical um, zone where we uh, create it by pumping down fluid, uh, usually water, until we get a pressure which will crack the rock. At that point, we also pump down some stuff called propellant, which is usually uh, sand. 
By doing so, we increase the area of the well bore that is accessible to the gas. And by doing so, we increase the flow of gas into the well bore. If the well bore did not, was not fractured, uh, if there were not fractures around the well bore, then the flow of gas would be non generally non-economic. We can monitor where those whoop, we can monitor where those fractures go. There's a whole series of techniques. One is distri distributed temperature systems down the well. The most common technique is microseismic, where basically you listen to the rock breaking. Uh, you are creating fractures in the subsurface uh, by breaking that rock, and when you break it, it squeals. Um, with microphones down another uh, uh, monitor well or elsewhere. Uh, on the surface, you can identify the point at which those fracks uh, uh, are occurring and how far they're going. And that is the, one of the key technologies used to see these fracks are typically, say, 100 meters uh, away uh, around the well bore. Um, I think the, the, the other advantage uh, of this is it's relatively uh, easy, non invasive. I would also like to make the point that. The distance, the height that the, the, the um, uh, microseismic tells you the uh, fracks have um, propagated is typically half the length of uh, of uh, the hydraulic con conductivity of a fracture, which you can measure from uh, reservoir engineering methods. You know, so the, the 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 active part of the fracture network is much smaller than that reported. Uh, generally in microseismic techniques. To protect the aquifer, we generally will cement off the upper layer. Modern methods of uh, drilling through aquifers use things like air drilling so that the, the, um, the aquifers don't become uh, uh, polluted with, even with drill, drilling fluid. But basically, there are, uh, up here, you have layers of steel and cement that protect that aquifer from anything coming up and down the well bore, which is um, uh, a, a really uh, quite a, a good thing. Uh, in the, it, it protects the aquifers from uh, drilling fluids, also from uh, fluids used in fracking. Um, these operations, fracking, are, are typically take um, uh, days or, or weeks. Uh, on the site, they're not there for years. Um, and uh, after you've uh, uh, got the well on production, you monitor the well for how much gas is it produced. And before you put the well into production, you know, it's going the wrong way again. Um, I think I'm going to give up. Um, okay, uh, you, you, you monitor the well uh, before you put it onto production to make sure the integrity of the casing is good, so you're not getting gas leakage up the casing. So this shows you, uh, basically, is a repeat of what we saw before, with the um, addition that this is what a frac site looks like in the deserts of North America. Um, that's a frac pond to collect the water to be used in fracking. By the way, you don't need to use fresh water. Other forms of water can be used. It's a question of getting the pH of the water correct to do the job you want. Uh, you could use saline water. Um, there are even now uh, uh, non-hydrous uh, fracking techniques uh, like uh, a liquid propane gel. Um, these are the sort of energy units you need to create the frack, in this case 15,000 uh, 15, horsepower. Each frack requires between about one and about five million gallons of water which is much less than you may imagine. It's, for instance, much less than you use on a, a US golf course uh, during the course of a year. Um, the frac fluids, now, uh, frac fluids themselves come in a huge number of varieties. And some of the ones used in the past are certainly exotic. Uh, people, for instance, have fracked in the past with carbonate rocks using acids, etc. But in, for this type of operation, so-called slick water fracks are the most commonly used method. That consists of a fluid which is 99.51% water. It has some um, 
sand added and it has some chemicals. Largely, these chemicals are um, fairly green. They are, uh, the industry is pushing more and more to use biodegradable chemicals, chemicals which do not, um, do not harm the environment in any way. Now, anything can kill you in a big enough quantity, but remember, this has been diluted one hell of a lot. Um, so uh, we're dealing with um, fairly benign fluids, but I think the public has every right to be concerned about what these fluids are and to demand disclosure of them. And the Shell supports disclosure of, of this information and uh, uh, wherever we are legally allowed to do so. Uh, this is a typical frack in the Haynesville, so that in Louisiana. So this is a section through the earth again. That's the well bore. It's uh, doing some interesting uh, gymnastics there. And eventually goes to uh, a 4,600 foot lateral. Into that lateral, you're typically putting about 17 frack stages. So you're creating 17 separate fracks along the length of it. Uh, typical job, about 7 million pounds of sand, about 200,000 barrels of fluid. Uh, that's the energy required to generate the horsepower to create the frack. This is the production profile that comes out. It's also rather interesting because in common with all unconventional gas wells, you get a lot of gas at the start and then it declines. And it generally it halves its uh, total uh, gas production halves within the first five years. Depends on the shape of the decline curve. But it basically produces a lot of gas to start with. And then it will hiss away for about 30 years. And um, you will, um, because of the low productivity, you will need to correct, connect up large numbers of these wells to produce large volumes of gas. Now, this technology comes with a lot of public concern. And public has every right to be concerned. I, if I look at what's in the literature, I, I frankly, if I didn't know, I would be concerned as well. And I am concerned. Um, you see pictures like this. You hear about problems with water management. You hear about pollution, problems with aesthetics, etc. The question really becomes, you know, what is the root? What is the story behind all this? You know, so. People say chemicals are not disclosed, used in, uh, chemicals used in fracking are not disclosed. Well, that's not true. You know, we support disclosure, we are disclosing chemicals, and a lot of the rest of the industry is too in North America. The, um, the overall uh, footprint of this technology has changed. If we go back to this picture, that looks awful, but that was a, uh, a development, a first generation development in the western US desert with a population density of less than five per square, mile, uh, per square mile. So that doesn't make it correct, but it maybe explains it. And you would never today go for a development like that. What's happened in the meantime is we've gone from single wells, we've gone to multi well pads. You can now put anything up to 36 wells on a pad. Um, the size of the pad is typically, while it's being developed, so while you're drilling these 36 wells, it's of the order of 100 by 200 meters. After it's drilled, at least 60% of it is recoverable. And typically, the locations can be uh, anything up to five kilometers apart. So these are the well pads of a, a development in an air, a more modern development in an aerial view. So shale gas and unconventional gas can be developed in Europe without huge impacts on the environment. It doesn't have to be done as it's shown in, as people show um, pictures from the US look, uh, look like. Uh, water usage is another one. We say we use an awful lot of water usage. Well, this is a comparison. <laughs> Um, this is power generation, uh, typical industrial use, typical public water systems, typical, uh, well, I don't know what quite other is, um, mining, and this is Marcella shale gas. So the volumes of water are comparable or less 
from being used for other sources. And they, again, they don't necessarily have to be fresh water. How about the, um, the, the arguments around hydraulic fracturing? Um, well, there's some results of an MIT study. Uh, there may, if there, how do I put this? There are lots of allegations in the states of pollution. Where we are, where you see things happen, it's often not due to fracking, but it's due to leakage along the casings of the wells. It's poor well integrity. And that's down to poor operatorship and not testing the wells enough. It shouldn't happen. Um, we talked a bit about water. Uh, emissions is a growing one. Uh, yes, uh, there are uh, more emissions from uh, shale gas than conventional gas, but it is still a lot lower than, um, than from, say, coal. And if you combine it with carbon sequestration, then you have an abundant fuel and a method of disposal of the waste gases, the carbon dioxide. And a lot of the problems with emissions are addressable with technology that exists today. Part of that is the, the reason why Shell introduced uh, five principles, which I'm not going to go into a, a detail with today, but around safety, well integrity, you know, so stopping pollution from uh, leaky wells around air, around footprint, around water and community. Uh, we feel that uh, the, um, the public deserves to know about this. And if, you're, and if your community is affected by uh, these sorts of developments, we at least will talk to you about them and try and understand your concerns and how they can be uh, mitigated. We did, we've done an awful lot of that in South Africa. And so, you know, that's sort of a summary slide of um, what's needed. Um, I was talking this morning about the importance of water management and baseline studies, community engagement I've talked about. You know, uh, a lot of that gas and oil is not extractable unless the, uh, the uh, financial system is correct. We need an honest and open dialogue on uh, the dangers and uh, issues and how they're mitigated. You need skilled resources. You need footprint. And outside North America, we need a very, and even inside North America, for that matter, in the likes of Pennsylvania, we need a big push on footprint reduction. And with that, I'll uh, skip straight to some acknowledgments. And um, I will try my best to dodge any questions you throw at me. I will pass them to Rachel. or. <laughs> Well, thank you very much, Melvin. That was a, a fantastic uh, introduction, I think, to some of the geology <clears throat> behind this issue, which we've we've been hearing so much about in recent months uh, and and years. Uh, and I not heard the, how how the geology of that uh, of uh, unconventional gas works and uh, how it contrasts with conventional gas and oil uh, so clearly explained. So thank you. Let's take some questions. There's a man at the right in the back row there. Yes, I'd like to ask about how fracking actually happens. Does all the fracking happen in the first part of the 30 years and then very little happen after that? Yeah, you're exactly right. It's when the well's initially being developed. You know, so if you're talking about uh, um, an exploration well, for instance, that's going to be fracked, you're, you're talking about maybe uh, a few weeks to a few months' work of the total well life, uh, well life. Some operators will go back and refract later, but in general, it's uh, right at the beginning. The gentleman at the end of the row just there, Steve. On your map of uh, the US, some wells are well to the west. Is there any uh, evidence that the fracking has uh, uh, had any earthquake? Sorry, on? Fracking in the, the west mm -hmm. of, of 
America. Yeah. Uh, is, is that uh, precipitous? Uh, that's interesting, a very topical question. Um, so, um, the, um, so I said you can use microseismic to monitor what's happened. If you use microseismic to monitor the, the, the breaking of the rocks in the subsurface, you find that earthquakes, sorry, uh, that's the wrong word. We shouldn't use, okay, so let me divert for a second into the Richter scale. So everyone knows earthquakes are measured by the Richter scale. Yeah, maybe um, we shouldn't be calling things earthquakes that create no damage, but um, it runs from about minus n to up to about 10. And each division is 10 times more powerful than the division before. So if you listen to the microseismic and the rocks breaking in the subsurface, most uh, seismic uh, events related to fracking are in the range uh, zero to about minus, uh, minus two. Now, it's not fair to, to, to really compare Richter scales with ground motion, but for the benefit of today, I will try. And you know, you need something above a Richter scale two to, for a few sensitive people in an ideal situation to, um, to feel it. Before you get any damage in a poor, poor area, a poorly constructed area, you would have to be up Richter scale four or five, I think. Um, so having said that, the maximum earthquake, uh, I think the Blackpool event was 2.3. Um, I think there have been some geothermal events that have been higher, particularly in Switzerland, where they, um, but the, what you're referring to, the big events, and the, even then they're not necessarily on damage uh, scale, are the water injection wells. So an example of that is the Rocky Mountain Arsenal in Colorado where the US government was using uh, a disposal well. In that case, you're pumping lots of fluid into the subsurface. And if you're pumping it into a low permeability rock rather than high permeability rock, you have the danger that you will um, push up the pressures in the subsurface and that pressure may um, uh, reactivate a fault. So please separate very clearly water injection from microseismic. Uh, that doesn't mean to say you haven't got to be careful because any uh, operator worth his salt will start with a view that you should not be disturbing the public. These, all these should occur at a much lower magnitude and you should ensure that your operations do not do that. A double-edged question, if I may. Uh, first of all, I'm not a geologist, I'm a physicist. So could you say something about the sort of pressures that are involved in fracking? Um, off the top of my head, no, because uh, it's, uh, it varies depending on the depth that you are within the Earth. So uh, the deeper you go, the higher the weight of rocks above, uh, which you, means you need a higher stress to overcome it. Um, you know, typical that the uh, I showed you there was a, a, a Barnett shale frack which needed 15,000 horsepower, uh, so a, a water, water, uh, a pump water to, to basically break that rock. But it varies depending on the depth of the horizon. So would you accept hefty as an answer to that? <laughs> pretty, pretty big pressures. Oh, yeah, I think they're, they're, they're fairly large. Yeah. Um, what I did want to ask you about is uh, the question of uh, returning CO2 mm -hmm. to the rock. Um, you'll forgive me for saying so. I think you're a little glib about saying the technology already exists. Uh, that's perhaps only on a, a small scale. Mm -hmm. Is it true that you could use return CO2 as a driver for raising the, the pressure and the permeability of the rocks? So some fracturing is actually done with inert gases and CO2 today. Um, they uh, tend to be sort of, um, uh, let's call them boutique fracks. <laughs> they tend not to be huge. Uh, they tend to be done for specific purposes. Uh, one of the problems they, uh, that's often found is they don't give as good a permeability as the, um, as the water fracks. Um, on the other hand, uh, if you look at um, 
what a company called Gas Frank do uh, in uh, Canada, uh, which is a gel propane frack, which comes with a whole different range of issues. Um, they claim that using that gives you much better uh, results than uh, water. Um, I think that's a relatively new technology that needs to be uh, explored in more detail, and particularly the safety aspects of it. But it does hope. But it's not the only technology out there that is being ex looked for for uh, creating fracks without water. Just wait for the microphone. Thanks. Uh, hello. Can I ask about the UK uh, reservoir of usable shale gas? I read that the Government Select Committee report a year ago said one and a half years supply. And we hear that a year ago, the American estimates of their recoverable gas have now reduced by 44%. Uh, that was uh, in the report in Financial Times uh, this month, uh, the last month. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, I'm probably going to answer you indirectly, because I don't know the specifics of the UK. Um, now, as I said right up front, a lot of the estimates of the volumes of gas in the subsurface are based on geological interpretation of data. They're based on whether the source rock has enough organic matter, whether the rocks are a low enough permeability, etc. And very few of these are actually based on having large numbers of wells where you actually have got producing gas. And those examples are all in the US, and they're all in fields like the Barnett, like the Haynesville, like uh, Eagleford, like Marcellus, etc. There you have real evidence for producible gas. Elsewhere in the world, with one or two exceptions, uh, and I exclude here the coal bed methane activities in Australia, for instance, a lot of the rest of it, the figures are best thought of as speculative. What I would say, though, is the evidence is on the side of there being lots rather than little. And um, the question isn't really how much is there, but how much can be produced in an economically, social, uh, socially and environmentally acceptable way. Steve, one of the gentlemen next to you. Uh, a very simple question. How, when you drill vertically for a long way, can you turn horizontally? Um, yes, these days you can. There's a limit to how, how um, far you can drill horizontally that's, that's related to friction and other factors. But yes, you can still turn at depth. I'm not a well engineer, so I can't give you the details. Sorry? Slow, yeah, you have to do it slowly. <laughs> uh, but basically, you, you use a directional drilling device that basically um, uh, turns the well uh, very slowly uh, in the direction you want to send it. Uh, and you do it in a way that with a flexible enough drill pipe and enough linkages in the drill pipe that, that you don't overstress it. Up towards the back there, on your left. Thank you. <coughs> Excuse me. You said that Shell supports the disclosure of fracking fluids, but you added the rider where Shell is legally allowed to do so. Mm -hmm. So I wonder what exceptions would not allow you to do so. If I can add a quick subsidiary question. When you showed the chart of water consumption, mm -hmm. Um, indicating the water consumption is very low. Is that per unit of energy or total water consumption? Um, let's do the first one uh, last. I think um, I think the uh, that, that's total water consumption. If I'm correct, I, I need to double check that. Um, on your um, uh, first question, can can you just remind me what exactly you're looking for? Okay. Right. Yeah. Sorry, jet lag. Apologies, jet lag is taking over. Uh, 
the uh, so the, the uh, a lot of these uh, drilling fluids, etc., the oil companies do not make themselves. In fact, most drilling fluids are not made by uh, oil companies at all, and therefore we do not hold the IP rights to them. So, uh, there are circumstances where there will, there will be a need for a serious discussion. Because again, we support disclosure. Okay, I think we've got time for one more question because Paul Melvin has to do this lecture again in a, uh, about an hour and three quarters. Steve, gentlemen, right up uh, towards the back there. Thank you very much for the uh, presentation. It was really enjoyable. Um, I was interested by your key concerns slide. Um, and interestingly, I heard Fatir Birol from the IEA. Uh, say that they're going to come out with these golden rules. Mm -hmm. And so I think that would be quite, the, the two together would probably go well hand in hand. Uh, but my question is, um, what's your uh, thoughts on gas exports in the form of LNG, um, given that there's some from the States? Um, I think uh, there is a fairly good chance that uh, the US and Canada will start exporting gas. I think uh, Canada certainly is thinking about it from the West Coast. Uh, uh, the US is also thinking about that, been trying to turn around the, um, the, the regasification plants into uh, LNG plants. And uh, I understand that in the last few days, the first license for export has been approved. Now, that's different from actually seeing the ship sail but it's a step in that direction. So that will change the dynamics of the LNG market, probably uh, particularly towards Europe. There's a number of these gasification plants on the uh, East Coast. Well, thank you. I'm afraid we're going to have to call a halt uh, to the questions there. But thank you all for your questions. Uh, and thank you again, Melvin, for a fantastic lecture. <laughs> and for taking our questions.